Okay, welcome back, guys. <clears throat> um, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, yes. Okay, sir. Yeah. All right. Okay, so let's start with peripheral artery disease. The the pathophysiology is the same as in chapter 33 and chapter 32. The patient still has atherosclerosis here, but the only difference is instead of this happening in a coronary artery, this one now occurs in a peripheral artery. There's a picture here demonstrating where they uh, commonly occur here figure 37.1, dash one. Uh, dash one. These are the common sites where you have the atherosclerotic plaque. So these are the obstructions. And the main thing to remember is, here is this is an arterial disease. So this can be serious because this involves blood flow to the extremity. So therefore, if you look at the, the figure, Anything below the level of obstruction or the atherosclerotic plaque, there will be poor circulation in the distal part. So the higher the involved artery, then the more or more, the, the more complications or the more serious your problems are. They um, occur in the same people who had risk factors for a hypertension. Uh, in fact, uh, if you look at the uh, pathophysiology here, uh, you have the same diabetics, okay, the same hypertensive patients, the same patients with cardiovascular disease. And when you say cardiovascular disease, that we're talking about coronary artery disease. Because it doesn't just occur in one particular set of arteries, meaning if you have plaque deposits, if you have atherosclerosis in one artery, that means they can also occur in all other arteries. So therefore, stroke, heart disease, and peripheral artery disease can occur together in the same patient. Okay, so that's why it, you have here patients with PAD have a significantly higher risk of cardiovascular death mortality, a disease mortality, uh, major coronary events, which is ACS, and finally, stroke. So as um, I mentioned in the lecture on act, uh, chapter 33, so the problem here is um, atherosclerosis. Let me, okay, so let's say uh, this is still a perfusion. The only difference here is this is not central perfusion. This is a peripheral perfusion problem. So this is still perfusion. So we still have problems with the pump, blood volume, and this time specifically we are focused on the blood vessel. So say this is a cross section again of a normal blood vessel. So in PAD, just like in coronary artery disease, the patient's artery lumen is now partially blocked because of an atherosclerotic plaque. Now the plaque here, if you look at chapter 33, is not on top of the intima layer of the vessel. So there are three layers of the artery. You have the externa, you have the media, and you have the intima. The plaque grows between the media and the intima layer. So risk factors are exactly the same as with um, hypertension and uh, heart disease, in PAD. The patient has high cholesterol, the patient has hypertension, may have diabetes as well. Uh, are smokers, are obese. Okay, so you have all these here. Tobacco, 
kidney disease, diabetes, hypertension, and high cholesterol. These are the same risk factors. The management will also be common. So this will involve vasodilators and of course, uh, drugs to lower cholesterol since it's the major risk factor here. So that's why the, the um, atherosclerotic plaque form was because of cholesterol deposits. So the main problem again, just like in hypertension is atherosclerosis, causing thickening of the intima, and then eventually leading to an obstruction of the artery. Okay. Um, here, obviously, this is uh, partial. We will discuss also the stages because there are stages in PAD. We'll discuss all that. So here are your uh, gender differences. <clears throat> so as you may have noticed in chapter 33, um, there are differences between the mortality uh, between males and females. So let's go now to our main problem. Again, diabetics have um, a high chance here because they double their uh, risk factor. Meaning if you have uh, diabetes, in addition to the atherosclerosis that you're dealing with, the patient has sluggish blood flow, especially if their diabetes is not well managed. So the, the more frequent your hyperglycemic episodes are, then the, the more frequent the sluggishness uh, you know, it, um, we call it um, sludging of blood flow. So if this is your vessel and this is your blood, if you have so much blood sugar present in your blood, meaning your blood sugar levels remain high for an extended period of time, this will result in sludging or thickening of your blood causing poor perfusion especially in the peripheral areas uh, that's why in diabetes you had two complications right they they divided them into macrovascular complications which you have two you have coronary diseases and as well as cerebral uh, or neurovascular uh, uh, problems, meaning you can have heart attack or stroke. In microvascular complications, so uh, your endocrine chapter says eye problems, kidneys, and then nerves also. This will result in um, peripheral neuropathy. Then you have GI problems as well, which is gastroparesis. And um, the most life-threatening of all, of all if, is, of course, the erectile dysfunction, okay? Uh, for me, anyway. <laughs> Questions so far? What? Professor. <laughs> yes. This guy, man. All right. Hey, by now you should know when I'm kidding or not, right? No, no, yeah, we know when you're kidding. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. Just making sure. Don't know <laughs> <about that. laughs> Where cervical dysfunction doesn't lead to death. But you can speak for yourself, though. Oh, dear. All right, let's look at manifestations now. These will depend on the stages. So the symptoms vary according to the how, how bad or... Um, how advanced is the patient's PAD? So you have here, no, that's not the table I want. Wait, is there a level of, of um, advanced PAD uh, to the point yeah. where you can't even uh, get a graft on? Yeah, um, hold on. Well, with, uh, with PAD, you can always have vascular surgery. Um, okay, so I guess this edition doesn't have the stages. Okay, so um, I'll just give you a rundown. In stage one, 
uh, there are no symptoms, so we, it's not even worth take, talking about. But the patient does have PAD. And I'll talk to you about the diagnostic testing, which is the ankle brachial index. Um, in stage two is really when the patient has uh, symptoms now. So in stage two, the number one problem there is intermittent claudication. So what is this? The intermittent claudication is pain when you walk. So just like in um, chronic stable angina or even in unstable angina, so let's say chronic stable angina. So you have a atherosclerotic plaque obstructing 50 to 70% of the artery. So whenever you have exertion, so let's say you're having sex, you're shoveling snow, you're climbing up to the fifth floor of a building, you are um, running, okay? So all these activities increase oxygen demand and oxygen consumption, correct? So in this case, it's not only the heart, it's also the peripheral muscles, okay, the, the skeletal muscles. So as you're walking, let's say you're on uh, Central Park, you're walking a good three, four miles. As the oxygen demand and oxygen consumption of the skeletal muscles increase, because the, the peripheral artery here is already partially obstructed, like here, so if this is your peripheral artery now, it's already partially obstructed. And when you're exercising, okay, uh, any ex, uh, exertional activity increases oxygen consumption and demand, right? So uh, you may be okay at rest because there's, you know, there's still enough um, blood flow to the extremity. However, when you're exerting though, oxygen demand increases. So the, the artery cannot supply because the, the increased oxygen demand, it can't do it because this is now already partially occluded. Meaning it simply cannot keep up with the um, increased demand because it's now narrowed. So the more narrow the thing, your artery, the more the claudication. So this is now stage two. So when your patient has intermittent claudication, uh, however, this is caused by exercise. Um, fortunately though, it resolves with rest. So when you stop walking and rest for about 10 minutes or more, the pain goes away. And then you get up again, continue walking. And then after several minutes, when your increased uh, oxygen demand returns, it increased oxygen consumption returns, it happens again. So that is what we mean by it is reproducible. The same thing happens when you do the same activity. Does that make sense? So this is also the same. So if you compare this to chapter 33, this would be the equivalent to chronic stable angina. The only difference is this thing's occurring in a peripheral artery, chronic stable angina, that occurs in a coronary artery. Okay, because in chronic stable angina, the same thing. You have chest pain when you have exertion. You shovel snow, you walk up the steps, you feel chest pain. You stop, you sit down, you rest, the chest pain resolves. Or you take a nitro, sublingual nitro, the pain resolves. Okay, so that is... So the concept is the same. Um, the pain here, just like in chronic stable angina, what causes the pain? It's really ischemia. Because when you have ischemia, that means your, um, your heart or your skeletal muscle in this instance continues to work in the absence of oxygen. Meaning because just because you don't have oxygen doesn't mean your muscles will stop working. We do it all the time. We climb steps. We try to force it, right? Or when we're exercising, even if there's pain, we try to um, exercise through it. The same thing with the heart. The heart really has no choice here. The heart has to beat. It, it's, you know, that's its uh, job to, to beat. So even 
So whether it gets oxygen or not, it will continue beating. Same thing as you. Although with skeletal muscles, there, there's a, a point there where, of course, you have to stop at some point because the pain is now unbearable. So the, uh, the cause of the pain there is the buildup of lactic acid because you're now switching from aerobic to anaerobic metabolism, meaning your muscle cells are working with, with less or no oxygen. Are you with me so far? Yes, Professor. Okay. Yeah. So now if we go to uh, stage three now, stage three probably the obstruction or the occlusion of the peripheral artery has now advanced. So this will now be more than 70% or more occluded. So therefore, the pain at stage three will now be occurring even when you're at rest. Okay. Other symptoms that accompany are um, neuropathic type of discomfort. It's not really pain, but it's discomfort. The patients describe it as burning, heaviness, pressure, soreness, tightness, okay, um, like pins and needles. Okay, so these are now uh, evidence of no blood flow to the nerves as well. Okay, so nerves also need blood supply. So if the nerves also don't get blood flow, they will have these sensations. Okay. So it's neuropathic. Uh, others are, uh, generally they're called paresthesia. Paresthesias are vague symptoms. They're not really pain, but they're really uncomfortable. Uh, if any one of you has sciatica pain, that's paresthesia. Okay, so the numbness, tingling, like I have that um, whenever I hit um, uh, 100, uh, over 160 pounds, I notice that if I gain weight, I have the pain. I have the paresthesia. And it's unbearable. It, it runs down my left buttock and then down to my foot. Okay, and then if I lose weight, it, it, it goes away. It's probably a pinched nerve. So this is now the pain that diabetics feel, the peripheral neuropathy, okay? So these are now indicating injury or damage to the nerves. Okay, let's go now to the other symptoms. Okay, the, uh, these patients can be, um, you know, join beauty pageants because you know what their skin looks like? They are very shiny and taut and there's no hair. There's no need to wax them because the hair loss occurs naturally. Now, of course, this is now evidence of less blood flow to the extremity because of, this is about stage three now um, and they may have pain, okay? Um, this is because the, the peripheral parts, uh, specifically the skin, the hair follicles, um, no longer get enough blood flow. So a natural compensatory mechanism is um, basal constriction, right? So if we have less oxygen, hypoxemia always trigger basal constriction. So the basal constriction results in this. So over time, several months, several years later, the patient uh, skin changes occur. Uh, you know, no more hair, no more hair right? And then the pulses are now diminished or even absent. It looks pale when you raise the leg. Okay, so you put the leg up, it looks pale. However, when you put it down in a dependent position, it turns red. The explanation for this is, of course, if you put it down, gravity helps increase blood flow to the extremity. And uh, in the same manner, if you elevate it, Gravity also prevents blood from going up to the, to the distal part. Does that make sense? Yes. All right. So um, chapter 37 uh, con uh, talks about arterial and venous problem. Uh, we'll have arterial problems after toward the middle and the uh, two thirds of the chapter. So the comparison is here. So this is what I mean by the um, 
the ulcers that form. So this is where you get the answer to that question. Okay, let's start here. So main thing to remember is PAD is arterial, meaning this is a problem with blood flow toward the extremities, toward the peripheral tissues. In venous, it's not an arterial problem. This is a venous return problem, meaning there's blood flow getting to the extremities. The problem is the blood cannot return normally back into the heart. Okay, so as a result, there is congestion of blood in the periphery. Uh, we'll look at the um, risk factors later. Uh, most frequent is um, smoking, uh, damage to the valves because our veins have valves um, because that, that will prevent blood from going back down as the muscles because there's only one way for blood to return to the heart. It's through muscle contraction. So unless you're moving, uh, blood cannot return to the heart, you know, unless your, mus your leg muscles are contracting. So that's why you probably notice if you take a long flight or a long drive, you're, um, plus you're eating uh, popcorn throughout the way or any other salty foods, you get, um, your, your ankles get puffy, okay? You're, it looks like you have, you're baking bread in your, um, in your ankles. Okay, so that's the main difference here. Cap refill here, it's see, it's normal in venous disease. It's delayed in arterial disease. Ankle brachial index, I'll discuss this. This is pretty simple. Um, I'll discuss the uh, underdiagnostic uh, shortly. Edema, there's no edema because again, there's uh, the problem here is blood flow, forward flow. The in um, Venus, there's plenty of edema here because this is a blood return problem. So blood is now congested or are, are pooling in the extremity. They, can't, they have less blood return to, to the heart. Uh, hair loss, uh, definitely there's none in PAD. I mean, there's no hair in PAD. There's still maybe hair in venous disease. Um, ulcers, okay. Both conditions will have ulcers because there's, uh, in, in arterial disease, obviously there's not enough blood getting to the skin. So uh, ulcers will form. Um, the shape of the ulcer are more rounded in arterial disease because you know, if you look at the shape here, these are arteries. So arteries tend to end in arterioles, right? And they become capillaries. So each, vessel, arterial vessel, tend to, to perfuse a circular area of tissues. So that's why the, when you have absent blood flow to, there, to those areas, your, the resulting ulcer is rounded, almost like a perfect circle. Like it's, it's like a punched out um, ulcer, okay? Like, you know, a, a paper puncher, you know, a hole puncher. Uh, it, it looks like that because of the nature of the problem. There's minimal drainage because um, unless it's infected uh, and there could be SCAR now. So the SCAR can be pale pink or it could be a yellow slough or even black SCAR. In the, the ulcer, and these are the uh, locations of the ulcer, arterial ulcers, it's typically over bony prominences or at the tips, okay? So it's, uh, it's similar to the locations of the ulcer in the diabetic ulcer, okay? It's usually on over the, you know, the malleolus is the, the ankle, you know, the bone over the, the ankle. Um, the toes, because you don't have much meat there, so they, they occur uh, in those areas. Here in the uh, venous, they, they are irregularly shaped. Uh, sometimes they start as one tiny ulcer, but because they're multiple, so let's say you have a cluster of um, 12 or 20 small ulcers, they eventually become one consolidated ulcer. They, they look nasty. Um, you know, they're, they're uglier um, looking compared to arterial ulcers because 
there's discoloration of the leg also because of the chronic edema. You now just imagine something that you, if you uh, watched uh, The Walking Dead, you know, episodes wherein you had um, walkers that have been in the water and then when they come out of the water, you know, they're, they're like, um, they're, they're melting. Okay, so imagine something like that. If you soak um, uh, human tissue in, um, in water too long, you know, it, it gets soggy. Um, there is a lot of drainage in venous ulcers. Um, they may have some sloughing, but there is granulation though. Okay, meaning it, it can heal because there's adequate blood flow to it. The problem again is not um, not uh, a, 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 an inadequacy of blood flow, but uh, a problem with venous return. There's plenty of blood flow in uh, venous disease. Uh, pain, of course, we have intermittent claudication here or at rest if it's stage three. And uh, the pain, the ulcer though here is not painful because the uh, there is no blood flow, so the nerve endings may already be dead as well. In venous, it, they are plen These are painful mothers. They uh, require also, if you look at the, the uh, treatment, oh, oh, treatment's not mentioned here, but these things are harder to treat. The venous, because uh, it takes, there's really no vascular uh, intervention in, in venous disease. All you can do is wound care and uh, compression uh, dressings like really tight compression dressings in order to promote venous return to decrease the edema and because the the dressings are so tight so the patient um it will aggravate the pain in um arterial disease if they don't respond to wound care um, the doctor will do vascular intervention so just like in um acs you know in mi uh, and STEMI or STEMI MI, we did uh, cardiac catheterization, right? We stented the, the coronary artery. We can also stent the, um, the peripheral arteries. We can also do bypass graft. So if we did coronary artery bypass graft, we can also do peripheral artery um, bypass. Uh, most common procedure is called FEMPOP, meaning femoral to popliteal um, grafting so it's also possible so it's it's um i wouldn't say easier to treat uh arterial but between the two yes i can say that for arterial um disease because there's um a faster treatment for it you no know, um vascular surgery um dermatitis doesn't happen or rarely happens in peripheral artery disease, it does occur frequently here. So on top of the ulcers that you have, um, the patient will have dermatitis as well, you know, because of all the um, soggy, you know, it's always moist. Um, and then you have the dressing, so it will irritate the, the dermis, causing dermatitis. Um, and it's also itchy, there's pruritus there. Uh, so definitely between the two, the more uh, the uh, peripheral artery PAD patients are more um, more likely to to win in a you know a beauty beauty pageant, okay, especially in the um, swimsuit competition. Complications: the complications in PAD is worse though because this one will, will result in amputations okay so you have amputations here if there's if the vascular surgery fails to um work meaning you know we, we, we can't save it it the the, the um uh, uh circulation is just so bad and then and we cannot stent it we cannot bypass it so it will result in amputations in um it, it rarely happens with venous disease. The problem here, again, is long-term. The wound care here, although you, if you're a wound care nurse, it gives you job security. I mean, 
yeah, these patients will be regular patients. If you work in a wound care center, you'll easily get these patients for life. Um, one wound would be would take at least maybe six months to one to two years to treat. Um, and then uh, in between that, they get infections. So that will, again, uh, delay the, the healing. So yeah, these patients will be regulars. Okay, You'll never run out of um, venous uh, insufficiency patients okay? because they're, they're pretty much your patients for life. Because the, uh, for one thing, the risk factors are not easy to um, get rid of, which is obesity, uh, smoking, um, hypertension. So th those are chronic uh, diseases in themselves. Okay, diagnostic now. So let's go to, and if, as you can see, the look at the management for PAD. It's the same as in hypertension. Okay, tobacco cessation, uh, exercise, DASH diet, and tight B BP control. The drugs used though, are only for PAD, uh, celastazole and pentoxypilin. Um, these drugs promote blood flow um, either by vasodilation or I don't know, I can't remember which one, but one of them increases red blood cell flexibility, meaning even in tight spaces, you know, tight arteries where they have up to 80% occluded or more, the red blood cells will be will become flexible and allowing them to squeeze through even those uh, tight areas. Uh, nutrition, obviously, that's uh, low sodium, low fat, uh, PT, and then foot care. And as already mentioned, so these patients will have the options of vascular surgeries. Okay, so any of these to improve blood flow, uh, stenting or bypass, just like in chapter 33. Or if can't if it can't be saved, then amputation. ABI. So this is the standard screening tool for PAD. It will also be the basis for the severity of staging the the patient. Um, it's quite simple. Uh, you divide the ankle blood pressure by the brachial blood pressure. Obviously, we don't have the tools to do this on the floor. So this is done under radiology. So the doctor, the radiologist uses a Doppler to measure the blood pressure. And the sphygmomanometer, this is your, um, the machine, you know, with the, um, that tells you the blood pressure. Um, so this is done under radiology. And these are your how you interpret the results. So the threshold is 0 0.9, as already mentioned in the table up here, comparing PAD from venous. So if your uh, if the product, oh no, the quotient. Okay, so when you divide ankle, ankle blood pressure by your brachial blood pressure, if the answer is equal to or less than 0 0.9, then you have PAD. If, if it's more than that, more than 0 0.9, it's normal, okay? Um, this one doesn't mean that, you know, if, if you have more than, then you have venous disease, not necessarily. It just means normal. But this just means in venous disease, when you do an ankle brachial index, it's normal, okay? So it's, there's no arterial problem here in venous uh, insufficiency or venous disease. I hope that makes sense. All right, and here is your severity, again, depending on the, on the answer. So on a test question for next week, uh, make sure you know your math. All right, so how you interpret the, the results. Okay, um, you'll be given, the, of course, the two blood pressures, and then you just do math, and then you interpret, you know, what does the patient have? Do they have mild? Do they have normal, uh, borderline, abnormal? And if it's abnormal, we have three classifications here, mild, moderate, and severe. 
So non-pharmacologic treatment first. So you modify your risk factors. We already talked about them. Obesity, hypertension, high cholesterol. Um, and if it's caused by diabetes, and then you maintain good uh, tight uh, blood pressure, uh, blood sugar control. Okay. Drug therapy now. Uh, they mentioned here other drugs because they are specific to the patient's risk factor. So therefore, if you have high cholesterol, then you have the statins there. So just like in chapter 33. Uh, hypertension, then that's chapter 32, obviously. Drug therapy. Um, similar also to PAD because um, the, especially in stage three, um, when the patient has pain at rest, it could be because of a rupture of the endothelium of the peripheral artery. Meaning just like in chapter 33, when you have um, endothelial injury or a rupture of the plaque, it can the, uh, cause the formation of a blood clot. So there could be an acute occlusive event. Uh, which of course may or may not last long. So to prove to to avoid the formation or lessen the likelihood of thrombus formation, the patient will be put on antiplatelets, just like in CAD patients or or ACS patients. So uh, typical uh, treatment is uh, aspirin and or plavix. And we have a drug alert here. Okay, so here is celostazole. So this is the drug that um, causes vasodilation. Okay, so it's pentoxifilin that causes the um, flexibility of the blood cells, allowing them to squeeze through tight spaces. Any questions? Professor, I have a question. Okay, so exercise therapy, yes. Go ahead. So with um, PAD and uh, PVD, there's um, the patient would not show signs of diabetes in PVD, only in PAD? Uh, let's just put it this way. It's a risk factor for both. Okay. Okay, meaning uh, a diabetic patient may have PAD and or venous disease. It's okay. just, uh, yeah, I guess uh, luck of the Irish, which one they'll have, PAD. Um, but most likely more common in PAD patients, but it can occur in venous disease as, as well. Like I said, obesity is common in diabetes, right? So right. therefore, these patients may have um, venous disease, or if they're really lucky, they'll have both. <laughs> okay, professor. Yeah. So they are really, you know, you have a winner there. Exercise. So same exercise recommended in chapter 32 and 33 because again the nature of the disease is from atherosclerosis. So same uh, risk factors, same management. Nutrition the same again. We try to uh control uh blood pressure. Uh so dash diet um, weight loss, okay, keep your weight um, under 25, a BMI. If diabetic, then control uh, your A1C. Um, okay, if you've not come across this yet, I know you have no pharmacology course, but throughout the chapters, um, have you had, well, this is your first cardiac chapter, so uh, never mind. Uh, okay, NSAIDs have been linked to increased cardiovascular mortality. So if a patient has heart disease, it's best that they avoid NSAIDs. This one, though, doesn't include aspirin. Okay, as, as you can see clearly, uh, we give aspirin to patients in chapter 33. So the NSAIDs here are the uh, ibuprofen, you know, I'll leave those over-the-counter NSAIDs. 
um, they increase cardiovascular mortality because they are, I mean, how they work is um, inhibit prostaglandin. Um, prostaglandin is a vasodilator. So therefore, if you take it, it causes, it promotes vasoconstriction. And you know what vasoconstriction does in cardiovascular uh, concepts. You know, it increases afterload, increases um, cardiac workload, etc. Professor. Yes. That is if the the patient or the that is if a, a person is using it on a regular basis, correct? Yeah. Like if uh -huh. they have a chronic, if they have a chronic situation and they're using it, or if they have a situation that they're using it. Well, I, let me go back with the word chronic because chronic will set you up for a longer time using these drugs. Yeah. Um, but um. For some people who have like migraine headaches, right? Yeah, or lupus or arthritis. Excedrin, um, excedrin comes in with big shots of, you know, all kinds of things in them. Yeah, and so basically it boils down to um, anything taken in excess is always harmful. Right. But Except, occasional, yeah, occasional, uh, that, that's well, fine. Good. Very yeah. well, thank you. All right, so the complication in that leads to amputation is uh, one, one of them is this one, critical limb ischemia. So this can occur um, almost without warning. Okay, so you have a thrombus formation, and before you know it, because the patient already has, especially if they're at stage three, so they're already used to the pain uh, anyway. Um, and they may try, uh, tend to ignore the pain here, uh, which is uh, uh, dangerous because they can end up losing the leg or their arm or whichever uh, part of the body is affected by PAD. Okay. Um, you look at the foot care. Is it any different from the foot care you saw in diabetes? The same, exactly the same. You know, wear foot care, never go barefoot, keep your feet dry. You can put lotion on the feet, but not between the toes. Okay, so exactly the same as in diabetes. So there's nothing new to learn there, really. So because of peripheral artery disease, so remember these patients have numbness. They tend to develop peripheral neuropathy, so their feet are prone to injury. So they cannot, they have less sensation there. That's why in the first place, they may have skin ulcers forming. Okay, other therapies are uh, to give drugs that, um, remember in um, chapter 33, if you read chapter 33, there was collateral circulation from chronic ischemia. So if the patient has chronic uh, angina, they tend to form new blood vessels so that um, process is called angiogenesis, so it's a compensatory mechanism. So here in PAE, we can give them drugs that cause their body to um, form new blood vessels. Okay, uh, but here, look at this statement right here. So if patients develop critical limb ischemia, that means their PAD is quite advanced and um, they, they have poor prognosis. Um, these are now the um, surgical interventions. Again, the intra um, intra operative is not testable. It's really the pre and post op care. So let's go straight to what do you do with pre and post op? Okay, pre op is any just like any other patient who has pre uh, pre op care, meaning you no know, the NPO. Um, you, you tell them the post-op exercises, you know, what to expect. So pretty much include post-op teaching during the pre-op period. Okay, that's fine. But this, because this is vascular surgery, so your main interventions or assessments here will be on circulation. So the acronym I always use to remember this is CMS, Circulation, Motion, and Sensation. So every patient 
who receives of any vascular intervention. So this will be the same after cardiac catheterization because we, we messed with a vessel, in that instance, an artery. This one is another artery. So the doctor messed with a, uh, did a procedure messing with a artery. Um, so a problem here will be occlusion of that artery. So there may be bleeding also, infection, so the same um, potential complications. So I will make sure I monitor the patient. Any area distal to the um, surgical site. So if the vascular intervention was done on the femoral artery, I make sure anything below that femoral artery has adequate circulation that there is motion there and there is sensation in that, in the distal part of that leg. So let's take it one at a time. How do you know that there is circulation there? Look at yourselves. How do you know there's circulation in your feet or your arms? How do you know? In the pulse. All right, first thing is, to, yeah, you assess you the pulse. Feel it. You feel it. You feel can feel changes yeah, you in have sensation okay very good what else capillary refill very good cap refill so all of these here so you have them check every 15 minutes exactly what exactly color temperature cap refill pulses sensation and movement is that clear again transfer is the same um, concept in any vascular surgery. So when we go to chapter 33 under uh, PCI after cardiac catheterization, do you examine the same thing? Exactly the same. Okay, so there's no new information to, to remember. Okay, so I want you to study this way. Okay, always relate the concepts, oxygenation, perfusion, infection, whatever. All right. Um, you promote circulation, so avoid activities that will restrict circulation, like uh, you can't wear your favorite spandex underwear, okay? your, um, your tight um, clothing, okay? you can't cross your legs. Um, when you elevate these leg, uh, people's legs, don't put any pillow behind the knee, okay? only on the, um, behind the calf, etc. Any questions? Okay, so please read um, the, the specifics, okay? So they hear, for instance, okay, don't put the patient in a um, flex knee, okay, because again, that will um, impair blood flow. So we have uh, stockings, obviously, that will promote circulation, prevent um, edema, prevent DVTs. And finally, because the patient had surgery, um, although that's not very common. However, if the surgical access site was the femoral, uh, remember, what is the profile of these patients? Why they got P, uh, PAD in the first place? What do they look like? So if you have high cholesterol, most, most likely, what is your weight? All these. Right. So imagine Overweight. Obese, yeah. Ob obese patient, 300 to 600 pounds. What does the groin area look like when they, when they receive a, um, let's say the femoral artery is the, how do you keep that area, that groin area of a 300, 600 pound patient clean? Close to impossible, right? Yeah. So yeah. most likely those are the patients that get surgical site infections. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because what, what else is growing in there? You know, you have yeast, possibly fungus, you know, mayonnaise, you know, uh, you know how to make mayonnaise? That's how they make mayonnaise. All right. Um, I'm just kidding. Um, so, um, uh, here, so this is now self-care. Um, Tell the patients to, you know, there are, there are risks, uh, no difference really in diabetes. So you have patients who have 
uh, less sensation to the feet. So make sure they inspect them. Again, never go barefoot. You know, basic um, uh, things, but you never know these patients um, have really poor self-care. You know, you would think that this would be um, come naturally with, with common sense. But um, yes, yeah, some people unfortunately don't, don't know these things. So don't assume that they, they do. All right, um, I won't test this part, uh, acute arterial ischemic disorder, so we'll skip that. Um, this one though, we do. So this is the Burgers and the Raynaud's phenomenon. They're really short, so this is Burgers and Raynaud's here. Okay, so these are two, uh, these are non atherosclerotic though. This is, has nothing to do with um, obesity, hypertension, hypercholesterol. Okay, so let's begin with Berger's disease. Um, the reason is this can also lead to um, amputation. The cause of this is smoking. Base, that's it basically. So these patients are usually smokers. Okay, so here, history of tobacco or marijuana use and without these no hypertension no hypercholesterol no diabetes okay so they just have smoking so smoking is your only risk factor here so you've probably seen smokers on tv say you know uh, they, they lost their legs they lost their hands okay so this is the cause this is burger's disease so what is the symptoms so kind of similar to pad so they still have the intermittent claudication they have uh, pain, paresthesia, uh, and then they have cold sensitivity, meaning uh, during winter, you know, their, their um, hands and feet uh, are painful. Uh, no lab tests to do it. Okay. Uh, actually, we don't know exactly why smoking does this to some people, and some smokers don't have them. Okay. So we really don't know uh, exactly how smoking does it. Okay, we just know the only risk factor for this is smoking. Um, so treatment is, of course, stop smoking. And then look at the uh, treatment. It's really the same as in PAD. So we use vasodilators, calcium channel blockers. We even have celostosol there or even Viagra. Viagra is a vasodilator. So um, they, they use it for Berger's disease. Uh, plus, you have the you know the added benefit of you know being uh, strong down there. Okay, and another drug here is IV iloprost. Okay, so that's another uh, drug I mentioned prostaglandin earlier. So it's a prostaglandin analog. So therefore, it promotes vasodilation, whereas NSAIDs are um, prostaglandin antagonists. All right, so this will help with the pain and then decreases the need for amputation. Um, and of course, uh, if needed, these patients will lose limbs, fingers, hands, toes, feet, legs. The other problem is Raynaud's. This one also is an arterial disorder, but again, no, no hypertension, no... Um, High cholesterol, diabetes, nothing. This can occur in healthy individuals. I had two nursing students in two th who graduated in 2016. I want to say no, 2017, probably. Um, two of them. They sit next to each other because their names are, you know, close. They're both um, last name was ending in A. So they were always sitting together and both of them had Raynaud's phenomenon. So this is an episodic vasospastic disorder. I don't know if one of you here has them. Uh, I think it's an unfortunate um, autoimmune disorder. Okay, um, so here, it occurs primarily in young women. So they fit the profile. They were between 15 and 40 nursing students. And the problem here is the, the vasospasm occurs on the arteries, 
the, the, the arteries specifically on their hands uh, go into spasms, causing considerable pain. And uh, the trigger usually is cold environments right here. So the, the contributing factors are the following. You have uh, cold environments or using uh, vibrating ma machinery, okay? Or if you have both. Um, so it, it causes bluish discoloration here because the arteries go into spasm, so they go cyanotic, okay? And this is what it looks like. Um, of course, you can stop it by uh, eliminating the, um, the trigger. Okay, so if it's cold and you start having an attack, then quickly um, warm, you warm your, um, your hands and your fingers. Okay, the, um, here, uh, episode last minutes, um, but rarely it can persist for uh, longer. And uh, treatment is the same. So we did uh, calcium channel blockers. So the look at the treatment is really almost identical with those in uh, Burger's disease. Although here also we mentioned the um, Viagra, right? So similar, we can also give um, a long acting um, vasodilator, nitrodur, okay, or the uh, transdermal nitroglycerin. And that's it. Let's go now to aneurysms this time. Okay, uh, aneurysm is a weakening of the arterial wall, uh, causing them to dilate or bulge, okay, uh, over time. Um, the the serious ones really occur anywhere in the uh, the course of the aorta. So the aorta starts from the from the aortic um, uh, trunk, and then the arch, and then the thoracic aorta, and then the abdominal aorta, which is the most common site, and then ends right here. Because now from there, from the abdominal aorta, it now becomes the left and right iliac arteries and branches out to renal arteries somewhere here, and then this become the femoral artery eventually. Okay, so the most common site is the abdominal aorta. Let's look at the risk factors first. Okay, so how do these form? Major risk factor is hypertension. Um, here you go. So hypertension, male gender, CAD, tobacco, high cholesterol, PAD, right? And then obesity. Um, tobacco is um, uh, the most serious uh, risk factor. Plus, if you add uh, hypertension to that, so you already have a weakened or a thickened um, artery because of smoking. Now you add hypertension, so that will weaken it, and then it may cause it to rupture eventually. We have two forms. An aneurysm can either be fusiform, fusiform meaning both the, the entire circumference of the artery is involved, meaning all layers, no, not all layers, uh, uh, two layers, the intima and the media are affected here. So the tunica intima on the endothelial lining and the media lining are weakened causing them to dilate. Plus, if you add hypertension there, it will grow bigger. The same thing here in a saccular form. So a saccular involves only one side, not a whole circumference. Okay, so imagine this is a, a dissected blood vessel. So it, you can see really clear the whole circumference of the arteries involved. Here in a saccular, only one side, okay, so only one half of the artery, you know, only one side of the arterial wall is affected. These are not, this one is called a pseudo aneurysm. Uh, this is C, yeah, false aneurysm. This is not an aneurysm. For one thing, there is no weakening here. Look at the picture. This um, artery is, uh, is um, there's a hole in it, meaning this is actually a hematoma. This is a clot, okay, so this is a, blood clot. This is a hematoma. 
so this is not really an aneurysm, okay? So that's why they call it a false aneurysm or a pseudo aneurysm, okay? It's not an aneurysm at all. So when does this occur? A, frequently, this occurs after, this is in fact a complication of cardiac cath, cardiac catheterization when you do PCI, either on the radial artery or the femoral artery. If you don't monitor it, or let's say the patient moves too much, or there's inadequate pressure applied to the um, access site, um, it will cause bleeding. So pretty much this is an area of localized bleeding. It's not hemorrhage either because the, the hematoma is contained. The, the structure that contains it is really the surrounding tissue. So in, in the skin, okay, the skin around the groin is keeping it from hemorrhaging. Okay, so it's, it's uh, think of it uh, as a localized um, bleeding. Okay, uh, you have um, a hematoma, basically. Um, and dissection is different. The dissection here, there is a tearing of the intima layer. So same risk factors in dissection. The intima layer ruptured. So let's say this is a plaque here, atherosclerotic plaque. Remember in... Um, Chapter 33, they had a good picture there of the progression of a atherosclerotic plaque. If the blood pressure, if the hypertension is high enough, it can tear through that, that ruptured endothelium. And then the pressure, the sheer high pressure of the blood will cause some blood to pool here and then peel the whole thing off. Um, let me illustrate here. I mean, I'll try. So if this is your uh, plaque, right? So you have an atherosclerotic plaque here, okay? And this is the vessel. And then you have really high blood pressure. Once this thing ruptures, okay, because of the weakening, and then you have plaque now. So here is a piece of endothelium torn, right? So the blood pressure is so high that the blood will enter here and rip this whole thing off. So this whole uh, section of, um, of endothelium will rip open, allowing blood to enter here. And the more this progresses, it will eventually rupture the artery. So that is a dissection. Um, so this is obviously an emergency because if this happens on an aorta, just imagine how much blood loss the patient will have. So they can go into shock in a few minutes. Uh, same thing also of ruptured thoracic aneurysms. So uh, let's go symptoms now. So these are your symptoms. Please read on your own. Um, in the abdominal aortic aneurysm, so this we call that triple A, um, there is a pulsating mass. So when the patient's lying supine, you'll see it obviously pulsating, or you can hear a brewy also. A brewy will be formed because the wall is, uh, arterial wall is weakened, so you can hear uh, blood rushing underneath there. Uh, most often, these things are diagnosed um, uh, what's the term? By accident, no. Um, meaning we didn't intend to find them. They just happened to show up during a routine test for something else. You know, they let's say you get a CAT scan for something or an, an X-ray. They they just show up there. You know, by accident. Now, when do we decide to repair? Uh, complications. Obviously, this will be. Um, the most serious complication is bleeding, a hemorrhage uh, because of rupture, either for a dissection or a aneurysm. So shock is your common cause of death there. Um, we already know how it's uh, diagnosed, so you just need a scan. You, see, you need a picture, so either abdominal x-ray or a CAT scan will give you a better picture. They are uh, repaired um, if they reach a certain size. If the size is small and asymptomatic, you just do conservative medical therapy, which is 
managing blood pressure, reducing cholesterol, um, uh, lose weight. Okay, so you control the aggravating factors. So here, uh, stop smoking, uh, manage blood pressure, um, control cholesterol and uh, activity, probably just um, uh, don't engage in really hard activity because of course that will increase blood pressure and may trigger a rupture. Um, blood pressure medications of course are used, beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, you, you know them. Okay, if the, once the, the, the aneurysm is already diagnosed, it will have to be monitored. So we monitor along with uh, doing all these, okay, so decreasing the risk factors. Uh, we monitor it. If it reaches, so let's say we failed at um, managing, you know, blood pressure, cholesterol, and the patient continued to smoke. So this thing advanced in size. Once it reaches five and a half centimeter, so that's about two in two no that's more than two inches already uh because an inch is 2.5 centimeters yeah this would be about 2.1 uh, inches maybe it needs to be repaired so two inches now is is quite large okay that's a, a big uh, aneurysm so that will increase the risk of a rupture so we have surgeries there's two ways to do it so this is open. So on the blueprint, it says they're open versus closed. The closed is endovascular right here. So this is endovascular. Um, again, I'm not testing the procedure itself, but the pre and post again. So this is just nice to know okay, that this is open. So the incision obviously is big because in order to reach this, that means the abdominal incision is quite big. Uh, even bigger if this thing ruptures. Um, uh, because, you know, it involves clamping. Look at this. The surgical procedure uh, involves clamping because otherwise if you don't clamp that, this will be bleeding. So, um, it's done quickly. So resections are done in 30 to 45 minutes because of course you're exposing the, all the um, uh, organs below the iliac arteries here, for instance, uh, to ischemia, right? Although that's not the only one. I mean, you have collateral circulation somewhere, um, but uh, you have to move quickly because otherwise here, especially if it's above the renal arteries, for instance, your kidneys might suffer. Um, along with the other tissues. So um, it, it's, it's done uh, pretty quickly. This one is safer in the vascular. Um, of course, this one, how they decide open and close is, I guess, based on the size of the aneurysm. So if it's small enough, they can do endovascular like this. So cardiac cath uh, style. So they put the uh, catheter here and then they, they deploy the, the mesh here. These are grafts. Okay, they can do one or both here. So you have uh, two grafts here. And as long as the blood flows through the graft, uh, eventually the aneurysm, this one here, will eventually um, decrease in size and it will wrap itself around the graft. So that the, meaning that the, the aneurysm is no longer exposed to the high blood pressure. So it will eventually um, go down. Okay, uh, they don't have to like uh, squeeze that or anything. It will just decrease in size on its own because really what's causing it to bulge out is the hypertension. So if you manage that and you put a graph to make sure uh, that happens, then it will just decrease in size eventually. Okay, this is now your post-op care. So the same, we do CMS, we monitor circulation, motion, sensation, and you just gave me the um, things to assess and uh, monitor complications. So here you go. We have bleeding. Okay, so we have endo leaks also. Endo leaks meaning it's leaking here uh, on, on a, here. So you have blood 
leaking out here uh, around the graph. Okay. Um, meaning you don't have an inadequate, I mean, you have an inadequate seal at the end, top end, or no, it's mostly the top end of the graph because there usually won't be a leak below. Uh, the leak would be above it. Uh, compartment syndrome can occur. This is, of course, um, the um, obstruction of um, blood flow. Um, you learn about uh, compartment syndrome when you go to uh, musculoskeletal injury. I won't discuss it today. It's too long to discuss. Um, okay, nursing care now. So again, pre, post-op, um, really the same um, with uh, almost similar to um, cardiac catheterization pre, post-op. So you need to check um, circulation, motion, sensation, distal to the affected part because you're trying to reduce um, blood pressure so you don't want them straining. So that's why you have laxatives here. Um, blood pressure control. Um, okay, pain management. Uh, if needed, uh, you do PCA okay? if, if needed, especially if they're post-op. Again, these are large incisions we're talking about, especially if it's rupture. Uh, the, um, uh, imagine how you cut a fish, you know, when you're cleaning fish for those who clean fish, the incision is that big, okay, if it's a ruptured um, aneurysm because now you have to clean the whole, the whole peritoneum because the blood will be everywhere. So you, you have blood clots, you know, a hematoma everywhere, so you have to clean them all out. And you, you can only do that if you cut them up like a fish. So you peel the whole abdomen off and then remove all the hematoma. So just looking, imagining the, the size of the incision, of course, they'll have massive pain. That's why they have PCA for those patients. Um, and then ongoing therapy would be, of course, a continued blood pressure control. And as already mentioned, monitor uh, neurovascular status. Um, these other... In, uh, Complication, let's say we did endovascular. So again, these patients are obese, right? So you may have surgical site infections there. Uh, GI status, remember, uh, not only was the patient, um, did they undergo um, GI um, surgery when you have the big, uh, you know, um, trauma to the GI uh, organs because you opened them up. They're also at risk for ischemia during the surgery. Remember, they, they um, uh, on top of handling the bowels during surgery, you also cut off or you clamp the, um, the arteries okay, to keep it from bleeding. So for a time, the um, GI systems, including the kidneys, have been exposed to ischemia. Uh, strokes are common for these types of surgeries, so you monitor them for that complication. And of course, peripheral perfusion. And that's it. Uh, dissection, it's similar, so I'll just go through this. The only difference there is the symptoms. So in um, aortic dissection, look at the symptoms here. Um, the, the pain is worse compared to the um, any other pain that you're feeling. So this pain is worse than an MI based on stories. Uh, I've only known one patient who survived an aortic dissection. It was one of my students' um, dad. Okay, so he shared to me, uh, he shared with me his experience because he's had both. He had a heart attack and he had a... Uh, aortic dissection, he says, it was the worst pain ever. So, which is consistent with what the textbook saying. So it's the sharp, worst ever pain, tearing, ripping, stabbing, okay? Uh, that's the description of the pain. So imagine a, a hemorrhaging patient with a lot of pain. 
So your hemorrhage here, shock symptoms are the following. So you have altered level of consciousness, absent carotid pulse, dizziness, syncope. Um, and of course, that will lead to cardiogenic shock and death. Um, complications, of course, uh, I'll discuss cardiac tamponade. I, I did it in uh, pericarditis, so just listen to that lecture there. I won't discuss it again. Um, diagnostic study, studies, the same as an aneurysm. You need a CAT scan to see it. Um, if it's not ruptured, it's treated conservatively. So blood pressure medications again. And we have to repair it. Uh, you can't wait for this thing because it can rupture anytime. So surgery will be considered. Uh, pre and post op care is the same. Um, it is 8.23. Uh, do you want to continue with DVT or do you want just to do the... I mean, I can stop up until 8.40. Let's do that. Okay, uh, never mind me. All right, phlebitis. This is now DVTs. There are three main risk factors here. We have the verkose triad this is a triad of conditions resulting in number one venous stasis number two injury to the endothelium three hypercoagulability you have specific examples right here table 37-8 so conditions that lead to venous stasis venous stasis is pooling of blood in one area of the body that pooling can be anywhere. It could be in your heart, inside the heart. It could be in your legs, in your arms, in your abdomen. So anywhere you have blood pooling, because platelets love each other, it will cause blood clots to form. So look at this list here. Advanced age, because you're likely to have venous incompetent uh, valves, when you uh, advance so your blood return is slower so you tend to have venous pooling in the extremities atrial fibrillation results in poor contraction of the atria causing blood to pool first in the atria and then eventually throughout the heart people who are on bed rest either impose bed rest, you know, they're ordered to be on bed rest because of their condition, or if they have just weak, okay, they cannot tolerate activity, they're on bed rest. Remember, blood returns only to the heart via muscle contraction. So your leg muscles don't work, they don't contract, you cannot, uh, you cannot return blood normally. So that will also include same is true for spinal cord injury patients because they're either paraplegics or quadriplegics and therefore immobility, uh, prolonged immobility. Chronic heart failure because the pump is not effective. So it's not normally producing cardiac output. So blood tends to pool inside. Um, fractured leg or hip. Uh, obviously, if you fracture these joints, can you move? Most likely not. And uh, you continue to have your immobility post-op. So pre and post-op, you're bed-bound, so there is venous stasis. Long trips, let's say a 16-hour flight to Hong Kong, or you're not adequately exercising. Obese patients, again, poor circulation, poor venous return. Uh, again, surgery, so we already have fractured leg or hip, and the surgical interventions for those will decrease mobility. Pregnancy, so for uh, moms here in the class, you know what I'm talking about. Um, during pregnancy, you have edema in your legs, so that's evidence that there is, because of the weight of the 
uh, uterus uh, pushing down on your pelvis so that will um, uh, pinch some vessels occur uh, resulting in poor venous return. Uh, stroke patients because they are immobile and varicose veins. Varicose veins are a number one example of incompetent valves. They form because the valves in the veins are damaged so they tend to, um, um, to blood tends to fall back and then if that occurs for a long period of time the, the veins become dilated and are called varicose veins. The other condition is endothelial damage. So what conditions cause injury to the vessel? Well, it could be anything. It could be trauma listed here. Surgery is trauma, right? So imagine how many blood vessels we injured when we undergo surgery. So each of those injured vessels, whether it's a capillary, a vein, an artery, will produce tissue factor and once tissue factor is already released it will trigger the clotting cascade it will trigger clots to form um, again fractures so so anything that will cause injury to the vessel okay so you have here um, uh, we talked about the pick line earlier during lab Okay, so that's notorious for blood clots. And then finally, the third of the triad is hypercoagulability. So this is any condition that causes you to more likely form blood clots. There's a long list here. So obviously, if you have poor uh, amounts of clotting factors, so of course, uh, I mean, um, sorry, if you have a, um, um, a condition wherein blood tends to um, thicken, such as in dehydration, for instance, or if you have elevated clotting factors, or you're taking drugs to increase your blood counts, okay, epoitin alpha, which is given to uh, anemic patients, those uh, cancer patients receiving chemo, uh, high altitudes, hormone therapy, because that causes increased blood volume, therefore blood thickens. Um, cancer, uh, cancer, unlike um, other people who have trauma, uh, I understand trauma will produce tissue factor, but in cancer, specifically in these cancers right here, it caused these cancer cells produce tissue factor for no reason. Therefore, they will trigger clotting. Uh, OCPs, the same thing, is same effect. This is hormone therapy and um, uh, smoking. Okay, so here's smoking, uh, anemias, because again, that leads to dehydration or low blood pressure, uh, sepsis, uh, specifically because of the inflammatory response, Sep sepsis leads to DIC. I don't know if you've already talked about DIC. Um, protein C deficiency, because uh, this helps you prevent clotting. Um, and protein C deficiency occurs in sepsis. Um, here we have pregnancy again because your hormones are uh, out of whack. Okay, so that's the same as you know taking hormones or taking pills. Polycythemia vera is in chapter thirty one. No, uh, thirty I think. Yeah, chapter thirty. Um, uh, blood disorder resulting in uh, increase in the red blood cell, white blood cell, and platelet counts. Um, thickens your blood. So once your blood is thick, then that is going to lead to hypercoagulability. So it's pretty simple with prevention because you know, if you know the risk factors, table 37-8, then you know who are at risk for DBTs. So in skills lab, we learned that who do you assess for uh, the risk of DBT uh, formation? Who do you implement DBT prophylaxis on? So these are your patients. 
advanced age meaning 70 uh, i don't know if it changed to 65 but um, in the hospital that i worked for our age for our dbt risk assessment tool was 70. so if it's 70 or over uh, that's one point okay and then it only takes two points in order to put them at risk so you have a patient who which is pretty much everybody because if you if you're active let's let's say um let's say zishan uh is admitted for um i don't know appendicitis for instance okay so he may not let's say he doesn't smoke he's he's not obese okay he has no risk factors however his condition of uh, uh, acute appendicitis costs him to have a mobility Okay, so for a while, he won't be walking because of the pain. Um, his, um, he, he is NPO, so he may suffer some uh, extent of dehydration, okay, either pre and even post-op, okay? So th those are examples. So it's, it's, it's pretty easy to score a two, uh, which, is your, which is all you need in order to be at risk for DVTs. Um, so therefore, prevention will be you try to control these. Okay, There's nothing we can do with some of them, but um, uh, just looking at it, since these are your three conditions, meaning every time you have venous stasis, endothelial injury, and hypercoagulability, hypercoagulability conditions leads to the uh, blood clots formation. So therefore, you try to implement your prevention uh, activities toward eliminating them if possible if they can't be eliminated then we go with our um, interventions already which is um, if they can't walk then we put stockings on them or compression devices or if needed we give them anticoagulants risk factors oh no we already talked about risk factors i mean signs and symptoms okay so it usually involves uh one leg okay it's usually involving unilateral uh, leg swelling okay edema um rarely does it affect two legs okay so you must be again a real winner if you get a blood clot in both legs uh usually it's 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 one um There's pain. If it's superficial, then you can see redness along the course of the vein. Of course, it, it, that, that's only for superficial. If it's deep vein thrombosis, then of course there's no redness to see because it's, it's, it is a deep vein, so you, you can't see it. So these are for a superficial uh, DVT or a deep vein thrombosis now has the, um, more pronounced symptoms. So this one will have more severe pain. So I already said unilateral leg edema, pain, tenderness, and uh, a sense of fullness, and they may have paresthesias, uh, erythema, and a slight temperature elevation. So the moment you assess your patient and you suspect DVT, um, there's only one thing to do. You um, notify a physician. Um, in order to diagnose it, we can't base it on the symptoms. We have to literally find it. Okay. However, if the doctor thinks that it, there's, it's, it's less likely to be a DVT, you know, he's, he, you know, he doesn't want to waste um, um, money uh, ordering a venous Doppler ultrasound. So he may order initially a D-dimer. So D-dimer is a uh, blood test. Uh, D-dimer is a um, fibrin degradation product. Uh, please just listen to the uh, recorded lecture on um, diagnos diagnosis. Uh, D-dimer is what's left over of a clot. So basically, the clotting cascade goes from uh, extrinsic to intrinsic factor 
um, a pathway activation, blah, blah, blah. Once a clot is formed, so you have a fibrin clot form, the clot will be, will be uh, the body will start to uh, dissolve that clot. Once you dissolve a fibrin clot, what's left of it is called the D-dimer. So therefore, a D-dimer is a fibrin degradation product. So the only explanation is if the D-dimer is high, that means your body is actively dissolving a lot of clots. So the, the higher your D-dimer, the more clots you formed. Uh, simple as that. The most fatal complication, of course, is if this becomes an embolus and becomes deadly now. So a fatal complication is pulmonary embolism. Um, depends on the severity. There are three classes of PE. We have low risk, we have submassive, and then massive PE. Uh, this is discussed in another chapter, so we'll discuss that another time. Okay. So this is a uh, D-dimer right here. So um, besides venous Doppler, which again is needed in order to diagnose uh, DVT, because you can't make a diagnosis based on D-dimer alone, but it does aid in the diagnosis, meaning if it's elevated, then it suggests you have a DVT. Again, the word there is it suggests, okay, it doesn't diagnose or confirm a DVT. So the only thing you do is this one. So a duplex ultrasound will confirm the presence of the blood clot because you saw it. Okay, so the ultrasound tech saw the, the blood clot. So it, it puts the picture up uh, for the doctor and then they'll make a diagnosis. Oh, here it is. We found it. Uh, prevention, of course, is to address the Virchow's triad. Um, so address the venostasis, hypercoagulability, and the endothelial injury. So I mentioned a few. Um, early ambulation is the best, but if we can't have the patient ambulate, then we'll left with with mas um, not massaging, but putting on uh, compression devices, stockings, okay, getting them out of bed. So anything you can do. You can also do passive exercises. Okay? So if they can't do active, then do passive range of motions. Right? That's, that's enough. Um, so here are the stockings. Stockings. And these are the compression devices, those machines that inflate with air alternatively. I'm sure you've seen them on the floor. Drug therapy will have to be uh, addressed in the uh, recorded lectures. We are out of time. It is 8.40. Before we go, any questions so far? Are we going to get the blueprint tonight? Yeah, I'm about to post it because I already have it here. Let me show you. It's already there. I saw it. Oh, did I post it? Yes, I saw it. Oh my God, what's wrong with me? Um, yeah, I guess I did. Um, any question? Um, I'm still um, uh, in the process of uploading the videos, okay? But you can start with your readings. Uh, I'm sure you, I mean, I'm sure you've already done the readings. Um, the lectures will just supplement what you've read. So I don't think you really need them drastically, do you? Or do you even need the lectures? Yes. Yes, Professor, they're very helpful. Yes, Professor, definitely. They don't put you to sleep? No. No. I just have a question. Where exactly on Blackboard is the blueprint? I don't see it. Um, I put it on the same place. That way you just go to videos, the same section, uh, videos. There's two folders there. And it, I think I put it in the cardiac lectures folder. 
How many videos have you posted so far, Professor? I'm sorry? How many videos have you posted so far on Blackboard? So I think only the CAD, yeah. Um, I have to, because the, I, I made a mistake when I recorded them. The file was, uh, the video format was ABI. I need to change it to MP4. Okay. Because my dumbass forgot to change, you know, click one thing to, to change the video file and uh, I didn't do it. So I have to uh, cut it down because they're so big. Uh, but Professor, just give them your YouTube link and let them just watch the videos on YouTube like the lab class has. That's the problem. Uh, when I upload to YouTube, it's too big. Oh, okay. So I'm uh, editing them, but it shouldn't take long. By tomorrow, it should be done. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Okay. Any